Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com. Of course, follow us on Instagram at filmmaker underscore you. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by Maria Gonzalez and Aika Miyake, uh, two of the editors of FX's Shogun. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Hi, Thanks thank for having you. Us. Um, I want to start with you, Maria, because you worked on the pilot, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. And yeah. whenever I talk to editors who work on pilots, I'm always interested because that episode sets up the whole series and there's a lot of work that goes into the pilots. So I'm wondering what were some of the story tweaks or pacing tweaks or approaches that had to change in the sh in the episode to set us up for the whole series? Well, the the you know the pilot, this particular pilot really felt kind of massive. There were a lot of moving parts. Uh, the scenes really ranged from you know deeply emotional to action driven. Um, so in order to unify them all and make them feel cohesive, you know, my personal game plan was, um, you know, I sort of had to think about it. And there were two things that were guiding me. First of all, I knew that we were going to feature a lot of actors that are not necessarily familiar to American and Western audiences. Hiroyuki has, you know, established himself um, in Hollywood and Anna is working her way. You know, she's had some prominent shows lately, but for the most part, everybody else was sort of an unknown. So I really kept that in mind, you know, aside from like a really sort of great entrance, um, which was, pretty much going to be handled by the directors and cinematographers. Mm -hmm. um, I needed people to recognize these characters. And um, the, the next thing for me was keeping in mind that almost everybody in this show was um, like every character is um, boxed in in a way they were like in a position where they're kind of imprisoned um because of their circumstances that are pretty much out of their control so those two things kind of led me to um going into close-ups probably faster than i i would on a normal show um not only to sort of allow the audience to familiarize with themselves with the faces but also to sort of give, give that sort of feel of being boxed in um, but, you know, the pilots kind of have a, a, a way of coming back throughout the whole season. <laughs> They're never really finished almost until the very end. Yeah. Um, so some of the things, you know, to specifically answer your question, you know, we did have some massive reshoots, um, on that, on that episode. Um, initially I think it was just to basically, uh, widen the scope of the of the show to really make it feel bigger i appreciate um, that you mentioned the close-ups because one of my notes while watching the pilot is like there's a lot of like it's closer feeling than usual like especially yeah. considering that you know like a couple episodes later when they're they have the military there they like pull up and there's this massive shot of like the grandiose of what's happening it's right it's almost personal so, you know i really did try to to let the big shots live you know for as long as we could we had some really lovely establishing shots um but then you know once we sort of got into the meat of the scene I was probably a lot quicker to sort of uh go in into the close-up just to sort of juxtapose you know the grandeur of like let's say Osaka Palace to the kind of um, emotional state some of the characters were in My friends and I would make little videos um, in our backyards, you know, imitations of Indiana Jones and Star Wars. And, you know, eventually that need to tell stories became more of a technical interest and an interest in the, the art. To me, what's exciting is using cinema in its full potential, which is rhythm and sound design and music. Our job is to set up expectations and then deliver on them. I'm Brian Cates, and this is my course in film editing. So um, one of the things you mentioned was um, 
you know, like having some, you know, you said it was a much larger sort of undertaking for the pilot. One right. of the things I read uh, leading into this was that some of the episodes had like a hundred minutes for a 60 minute episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is that a, was that an accurate thing that I read, I guess, but what are some of the struggles of like what to cut out when you have a story that's basically a feature film each episode? You know, this is something that we all kind of had to deal with across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it became more manageable as, uh, as our directors and showrunner became more aware of these issues, you know, and the shooting progressed, we were actually shooting for 10 months. So a lot was learned during that time period. But, you know, there was so much effort put into authenticity that it included everything. Um, even the movements on set, we had a, a master of uh, a gesture of gestures. Yeah, on set. So, you know, that a lot involved um long entrances and long exits to scenes a lot of bowing you know if somebody is in a subordinate position they would bow almost before every line <laughs> they say um with some of the women you know they were so restricted in their movements in the kimonos it was they had to keep their knees together so standing up and sitting down took forever you know, and I think in the initial cuts, at least I wasn't sure how much of that we were allowed to really cut out because um, in our tone meetings, it was emphasized that, you know, they are wanting to be respectful towards Japanese culture and authenticity, authenticity was so important to the creators that, you know, I just let it, I let it ride. And, and you know, I let um, the pacing that was set on set be reflected in the cut. Of course, you know, the pilot, I think, ended up being 70 something minutes, the final cut. Mm -hmm. But, you know, originally, I think we were closer to two hours. Wow. So uh, and it wasn't just the gestures, you know, we had to. So some of those things we just had to start cutting out. We just couldn't, yeah. you know, show every bow. And um, um, but then also we had to really methodically go through the dialogue and analyze which mm -hmm. you know which lines um service the the story and which don't um so a lot was cut out you know in terms of scenes like you know talking about the pilot there wasn't really that much that was cut out um we actually added scenes only mm -hmm. a couple of minor scenes were cut out there was a funeral for peter zoon who's the guy who was you know boiled to to death um that was a small scene. There was a, a small scene between uh, Blackthorn and um, uh, Muraji, where he actually first hears the word shukume, but we we decided to cut it. So you know, in terms of the structure, the 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 show pretty much stayed, you know, true to to the original script. No, I, I we we mentioned it before, but you have there's a scene in episode two where Blackthorn's talking to to Naga, and initially they have the Portuguese interpreter, and then we mm -hmm. slowly transition so it's just him and Tanaga speaking. Yeah, and I'm wondering how you approach this scene because I was I was hoping after I watched the scene that every scene that had an interpreter they would do this sort of dance and then like switch because it was so. Uh, natural feeling and I'm wondering how you you approached it to get that that across so that scene we really like we edited we edited till like very last minute to find the just the right balance of of like be able to for the audience to understand that they are still speaking in different languages but um like you know like it's it's just them and the intense conversations happening. And so until at, at first, like in the script, like it was already planned to have the, like only them having the, the intense conversation. That's why like it's shot in like extreme close up mm -hmm. and, and really amazing angles. Um, and so we knew we had to make this transition smooth as possible, but it was really kind of like, oh, where should we try to um, like fade out Arvito's, uh, Father Arvito's voice? And we tried many, many places and ended up actually 
extending a little bit more. They they added like an ADO line where we just hear them that you feel that albedo is uh, translating, but it's mm -hmm. not there. It's it's like you don't really recognize what he's saying. Thing. Yeah, no, I noticed that it goes like down. It's like lower. Yeah, yeah. Like the sort of feeling that he's talking yeah. around. It was like a really delicate dance of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, yeah. it was fascinating and it made me think. So years ago, I worked on a project uh, for the indigenous groups here in Canada. And one of the things was in one of the scenes, <clears throat> essentially they were saying goodbye, but it would took like a couple minutes. Whereas mm -hmm. in English, we would just say, all right, goodbye. <laughs> right? And we were, and we were sitting there and I was talking to the director and she was saying, in that culture, they don't have a word for goodbye because goodbye is essentially you're dying and you're never coming back. So it's always these long sort of like, we will see you again in the blah, 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 blah. And I'm, what happened then though with the translation is that we saw the person would talk for a while and they would just say goodbye or something like that. So we had to start playing with the pacing based on the language differences. And I'm wondering with translation or with the... Um, the Japanese language, the Portuguese, well, Portuguese is played out in English, but I'm wondering if there was sort of like a pacing shift or if that impacted your guys' pacing in any way. So like a Japanese, naturally, especially the Jidaigeki classic Japanese, it just creates a lot more pauses and a lot, it makes it like twice longer than what's in English. Mm -hmm. So that was something we always have had to be in mind to to close up or trying to cut to another angle so that the, the pacing is is keep moving. It doesn't have like the mm -hmm. dragging feeling. And I actually come from a uh, uh, commercial background where you only have one minute to tell any story or 30 mm -hmm. seconds to tell like compacted story. So I'm, I, I was just, um, I've been listening to from my friends and like peer editors that about this pacing and like 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 how I do this and I was just thinking about um, why I really it, it comes so naturally that I don't even think about it but like like I thought like oh it's probably because I'm so used to try to uh, understand what pacing audience can understand the information the emotions and like situation like there's so much so many things happening at the same time but i'm always aware that the how much audience will be able to take in and, and depends on that i will create the pacing and especially like like the map scene with mariko and and toranaga and braxon it has three of them also have like underneath agendas and it's um it's really complicated and it could be dragged out and long longer scene but um i really uh was able to kind of find a good pacing to keep moving and like not let the scene drag hmm. so when when because you were talking about the pauses though and then thinking about uh what was said earlier like trying to respect the the culture of the Japanese culture but also telling the story was there a fight like did you guys leave in some of the the pauses or did you try and tighten them up or yeah. how I did mean, that work yeah we had yeah. to I mean a lot of you know when I was assembling the scenes uh I basically used intuition <laughs> trying to because I don't speak any Japanese unlike I could <laughs> so um you know, you're basically using intuition, trying to make the scenes flow the best possible. Um, and then, you know, for me, you know, part of my process was actually having um, one of our assistant editors, a Japanese speaking editor uh, assistant, um, watch through the cuts and flag things that are maybe a little off. I also would do a pass with Aika just to make sure that things natu flow naturally for Japanese. And I was actually surprised how often I did an, a good job. <laughs> Rarely did we move things around. And then ultimately, you know, two of our producers, um, Eriko and uh, Hiroyuki Sanada himself, who was one of our producers, would watch the cuts and make sure that the Japanese is authentic and flowing properly. Right. I, yeah. So that yeah. was 
that was our full sort of editorial process. And to add to that, Hero and Erico supervised all of our ADR sessions. So, you yeah, know, they really followed it through. Um, yeah. Probably one of the smartest things I've ever done for my career. It gave me all the tools that I needed to be able to jump into a, a new career. Getting myself into a mindset, thinking like an editor, being around people that I can talk to on that level was really invaluable to me. A lot of the things that I learned from that class, I still think about. I loved the classroom. I love the computer station. We built a sense of community. And it also instills a lot of confidence in you to take that and go out into the world. After I took the class, I felt very prepared to take the next step. I owe Manhattan a workshop. The career that I have right now, things have been going great and I really have the Manhattan at a workshop to thank for that. Now, I, I was going to ask about the sound design behind this and like, because a lot of it, it feels like the, the natural sounds are the score essentially. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering how much uh, work you guys put into the sound design on your cuts. Well, we did a lot of temping, you know, I have to sh give a shout out to my assistant, Lori, who was pretty amazing. And I think, you know, Ika's assistant, yeah. uh, Beth as well. I mean, we did a lot of work in the cutting room, but honestly, you know, the way, you know, we can't really take any any credit away from Brian Armstrong, our our sound supervisor, and and the way our um, spotting sessions were structured, we actually had um, Brian and our composers um, attend the spotting sessions together. So you know, Atticus and Leo and Nick were there along with Brian, and they I think they worked together um, in the past as well. So they already sort of had a shorthand. And we knew that, you know, the score and the um, the sound design was going to flow together and often sort of intersect mm -hmm. in a way that you can, really can't tell. Now, and I don't know if this is even a question, so I apologize, we can cut it out. But um, <laughs> I think about like the canon scenes and sort of in one episode, we're setting up the canons that they work, that they fire and land and what have you and then in the next scene or in the next episode is sort of the the two uh, uh the sun sort of messing things up and killing a bunch of people with the cannons mm -hmm. but there needs to be that sort of through line through it making sure that the setup's properly done so that it works off and pays off in the next pays one off. so how did you guys work as a team in as editors to make sure that the, that one scene worked and paid off in the next episode um were the cannons introduced probably in three right yeah i think so like well they um, get the cannons over and then they practice with them and yeah that was that was a lot of that it was in four but um i i did four um but you know in terms of you know we all had to communicate and yeah. you know when it comes to ika and i specifically we the two of us were actually kind of lucky to be paired up i mean it's just by chance you know we did episodes one and two and those were shot in a block Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, you know, back and forth uh, happening between the two of us. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a cutting room up until the first director's cut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so everything was remote. So basically, Thomas, uh, Ika and I would like get together for coffee fairly regularly just to sort of have a chance to talk in person. Um, but I think Ika and I specifically, because we were in the same block, so we were together on one and uh, two and then again on four and five sharing right. directors in both cases and then ultimately we uh, shared a credit on 10 um, and you know a lot of hours spent chatting in the car <laughs> to and from <laughs> the office yeah. or yeah. wherever you know anytime there was like a downtime to sort of uh, share our opinions of performances or you know whatever just to make sure you know, this is what's happening in my episode. How are you handling it in your episode? And, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of that. Yeah, sure. definitely. Well, I, I'd love to know, um, cause you sort of mentioned it talking about performances. So how do you guys like to assess uh, performances when you start to get the footage in? I would, I, I, I just love watching the footage and I, I just immersed into, you know, what um, actors uh, have done on stage and like it's it's just 
really I really try to feel it feel the scene as much as possible and um, whenever I feel it I'll mark it and and I'll go back and watch it again and and try it out and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but once you watch all of the footage it, I can feel like this this performance has to be the center of this scene mm -hmm. and I will work around that the performance and build up the scene that way sometimes Right. how about yourself uh yeah i mean i i you know one of the things i just like Ika, i love watching dailies and sort of fully immersing myself you know i usually respond to more sort of subtle performances i you know i love little changes in the facial expressions um those are the things that really mm -hmm. kind of excite me and actually it took me a beat i have to say um on this show, you know, and, he, and my perspective even changed. Like there are certain actors uh, that, you know, probably performed for a long time in Japan. And I think for, you know, my, from my perspective, sometimes it was like, whoa, that's really out there or like mm -hmm. kind of almost felt over the top, you know, and it took me a minute to really take it in um, and respond to those you know performances in some yeah. cases some of the older uh, actors yeah yeah and also like the fun fact about um japanese um actors and acting is that in japan um a lot of actings are very overly like overly overacted like it's big acting is a good mm -hmm. acting in Jap in Jap like a, a lot of japanese film and tv industries and in Shogun, it was something that um, the showrunner Justin was saying from the beginning. He want he want it to be subtle and more Western feel, but um, also bring like more authenticity authenticity of Japanese people. And so a lot of the the footage will find like a it starts kind of big, but then they are directed into more subtle performances so there's like a guidance for us to choose like a, we have you know like a variety of acting hmm. size sizes yeah. i guess <laughs> yeah so it's it's really interesting to see and i'm really really happy to be able to involve in a show like this because uh, i moved to i moved to the states uh, back in 2019 kind of feeling that that I grew up watching a lot of Western uh, media, like Western Hollywood mm -hmm. movies and TV shows. And, and I, I was not able to enjoy Japanese TV so much because of these big actings. <laughs> and it felt really uh, like, um, like it, doesn't, I, it doesn't feel relatable to me. So I just mm -hmm. never really uh, got into it. And I was like looking around, I wanna do more narrative shows and narrative uh, features and stuff. But I, I felt like, I just hit the wall in Japan, so I moved to the States and yeah, so like I'm really like when when Justin told me about it at the very beginning, I was like very excited. <laughs> uh, I have one last question for you guys. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Oh, I got <laughs> me. Uh, it's uh, definitely Seinfeld for me. <laughs> for <some reason>. okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, 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 it just always like pick me up and like, uh, uh, it's just really funny. And like, I love the characters and I love like, it happens around nothingness of life. And <laughs> yeah, I, I always go back to science. What about Curb? What Curb Your Enthusiasm? So Curb Your Enthusiasm, I, I, I actually couldn't get into it. Uh, earlier on but I'm I, I'm watching the later seasons uh now but uh yeah like I just uh I'm more Seinfeld fun yeah <laughs> how about yourself Maria so I don't know that I fully like buy into guilty pleasure like I don't want to feel guilty about you know enjoying <laughs> entertainment but if I had to I do feel guilty about sometimes enjoying um uh reality so right. I do, I do, but, it, you know, 
like so top chef has always been like one of my favorite shows um oh, yeah. but but yeah but Thanks. you know there you go <laughs> well thank you so much for letting me interview today thank, thank you, you so for much. having that's us yes <laughs> and that's everything for this week everyone make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or of course on instagram at filmmaker underscore you i'm gordon raquel thanks for watching